Adventures in Illinois Law, Part 1, Draconian Legislature at the County Level. Read by the author Shane Radliff, originally published at LibertyUnderAttack.com on May 21st, 2015. Part 2 will be released uh, the, this week. Introduction. There's certainly a major issue in our society when it comes to those with mental deficiencies and the wrongdoings they commit because of said deficiencies. I will be the first to concede in that argument. Although I feel like the focus is extremely misplaced. The majority of the focus seems to be placed on those that, uh, that use vices. That can range from alcohol to marijuana all the way to methamphetamine. Yes, there may be some issues, minor or major, with those that choose to use some of these substances, but it should not be a crime for people to use the subs these substances, as no individual, individual or entity should be able to tell you what you can or cannot put into your body. That decision is yours. The major reason that these vices are even a problem in our society is because of the cash cow of a black market that is created by their proposed illegality. As we've seen with plenty of examples, Colorado for one and Portugal for another, once the in illegality is taken out of these substances, people are more likely to seek help for their addiction and the crime rates drop significantly as the drugs aren't profitable anymore and they're also not in danger for admitting their problem. The true issue with the manufactured drug problem in our society is the draconian, le dr draconian legislation that it allows the King's Guards to toss someone in a government dungeon for 25 years for possessing a plant. The question to ask yourselves is this, who are the real people with mental deficiencies? The ones that use these easily accessible drugs thanks to the war on drugs, or those that pass legislation in conjunction with the complete and utter fail of a policy known as the war on drugs. Those with the most dangerous mental deficiencies are those that pass and support this legislation for the common good, which always increases the size and control of government as well as their financial portfolio, especially when it relates to the drug war. And to reiterate a point I've made many times previously, it always results in the destruction of your freedoms and should be something consistently and vehemently opposed. All I've said before this point builds up to my extremely recent attendance of the McLean County Board Meeting and the legislation that has recently gone into effect, one day after said attendance to be more specific. Build up. I attended the McLean County Board Meeting on May 19th, 2015, which was in fact my birthday. Before I move forward into the original intent of what has turned into part two of this article, I feel there are some, there are some important things to mention in regards to my surely unique experience. They range from tax levies across the board to the normal parliamentary procedure, all the way to the state of speeches where I have unfortunately come in contact to, um, where I have unfortunately come in, co in contact to in prior circumstances on more than one occasion in the past week. The McLean County Board Meeting. The date was May 19th, 2015. I entered the government center in downtown Bloomington at approximately 8.50 a.m., about 10 minutes prior to the start of the board meeting, in room 400. <clears throat> I entered the room and sat down near the back of the relatively small room. I sat down and prepared for what I was about to endure, took a few sips of uh, my non-fluoridated alkaline water, and waited patiently for it to begin. At about 9 a.m., the incompetency of government already started to show. At about that time, Mrs. Kathy Michael, the McLean County Clerk, who just within the past week received my most recent article on her Facebook page regarding me being forced to serve as a juror, stood up and said something along the lines of, This meeting will be postponed temporarily as we are waiting on some printed material. We will provide cocktails Will you wait. And obviously that's not, uh, that's not verbatim, but the important part is that they were not prepared for the meeting. And I uh, wish I could cite it precisely, but McLean County hasn't provided the audio that they promised since April, and my memory is not perfect. But moving along, I was simply a spectator. I was watching the actions of everyone in that room and their interactions with the bureaucrats, as well as many other things. The first thing I noticed was, uh, I was that I was the youngest one in the room by at least 30 years, minus one 30-something old lady. I'm assuming she was another one of those ginos, journalists, and name only. But I surely hope I'm proven wrong. The next thing I noticed was the copious amount of older folks there, 65 and up. From what I saw at, the, at my first and hopefully only appearance at a county board meeting, it seems like they've dropped the 6 a.m. meetings for coffee and breakfast and have started attending county board meetings instead. The first thing I felt was a sense of not belonging. The thought actually entered my mind that I would be involuntarily committed or arrested for some arbitrary law. 
Unfortunately, that was not some ridiculous fear manufactured in my mind, but certainly one I was worthy of having, especially considering the views that I hold and have openly written about and have semi teased the bear with. <clears throat> Thankfully, it only stayed in my mind for a few seconds, and after that momentary point, my mind was open to listen and watch uh, watched what was happening before my eyes. First thing I noticed a few minutes uh, after I entered was one bureaucrat speaking to two gentlemen at a table way off to my right side. I saw this bureaucrat approach them, and I witnessed the two folks' eyes light up and their faces glowing, a sense of humility and respect just being in this person's, pre person's presence. It immediately, immediately made me consider a quote from one of Larkin Rose's books. One of Larkin Rose's books. Quote, you feel pride being able to say you once shook a senator's hand or saw the president in person. Ah, yes, the grand deity himself, his royal highness, the president of the United States of America. You speak the title as if you're referring to God Almighty. End quote. Now, it may not be a senator or president's hand, but regardless, it's still a form of higher authority, and that is universal. It doesn't matter what title, what level, or what jurisdiction. Authority is authority, and the point is that they envision this man as being above them. Continuing on, about 10 or so minutes late, the meeting convened. First item on the official McLean County agenda was the call to order. Nothing substantial about that. The next was something called an invocation. For those like me who are previously unaware of what that meant, the multiple definitions from Merriam-Webster Merriam include um, definition number one, quote, the act of asking for help or support, especially from a God, end quote. Definition number two, uh, quote, a prayer for blessing of guidance at the beginning of a service, ceremony, etc., end quote. Definition three, quote, a calling upon for authority or justification, end quote. Immediately, there is something very wrong here. Either this invocation was a request from a god or calling upon for authority or justification. Since the majority of Merriam-Webster's definitions involve some sort of a god or deity, let me just post a couple of quotes here to prove to you how wrong it is for this sort of thing to happen in any legal setting. First is a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, uh, from chapter 17, quote, As a member of the Roman Catholic Church, I was more particularly brought into contact with several of its priests. They mainly attributed the peaceful dominion of religion in their country to, separation, to the separation of church and state. The last one is an excerpt from the Treaty of Tripoli, Article 11, quote, The government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, end quote. Whether it's a call for authority or a prayer, it really doesn't matter. The simple fact that someone or multiple people are claiming authority over you is wrong in so many ways. As Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, quote, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make ye free. End quote. You can't be free and have, have people ruling over you. That's just not possible, and every single instance of any ruler in history will prove it to you. There is much more, so please let me continue. For the sake of conforming, I stood up when the Pledge of Allegiance came up. I did hold my hand over my heart as I do not worship this flag, which I explained in a previous article. The Pledge of Allegiance was actually started by a socialist, Francis Bellamy, which most are completely unaware of. It's no coincidence that this is damn near force in every single government school across the nation. After the Socialist Pledge of Allegiance, what came after that was roll call. Um, there's nothing substantial about that either, but I did notice a few board members that were absent, which isn't a surprise. Matt Sorensen then informed the rest of us that the order, of, the order of the agenda was going to be changed, and what transpired next was certainly interesting. Again, I'm awaiting the audio, as government at any level is incompetent, um, but I will share the exact status speech audio as soon as they put it up. But my god, it was fantastic. There was a lady who, sure, uh, there was a lady who surely looked like a hippie that approached the podium. Before I paraphrase what she said, it's interesting to see her change in mindset since Woodstock up until today. Although I did find out from a colleague that most Woodstockers have left behind their values and ideals that they previously held, so it's really not a surprise. She approached the podium and said something along the lines of how the Coffee with Cops program was fantastic and that it allowed her to understand what they go through on a daily basis and how hard and dangerous their jobs are. She went on to state that the armory reenactments also showed her how fantastic they were at teaching and indoctrinating the public how to... I guests defend themselves from a civil war, civil war or world, world war II attack? 
No, it sounds vague, but in, in my research, I couldn't find anything else other than those two examples, and this may require clarification later, uh, but I will take that risk. The point is this. <laughs> Her and every other person in there, except for me, obviously, were bleeding sadism out of every single orifice on their body. There was one other award from a cop as well, but I honestly don't remember his name or the reason, but it's worth a mention in passing. Next, there is a proclamation of the McLean County Board in recognition of Paul Penn. This was probably the point where I was the most confused. This man passed away on May 7th, and I still have no idea why he was honored at this meeting. From what some bureaucrat said, he was just he was a local business owner and did a lot for the community. From looking at his obituary, I am just as lost as before. Not to dis disrespect this man's life at all, but I would like some explanation as to why he was honored when people in this county die every single day with a lot of the same qualifications. In addition to that, why wasn't that time allocated towards the budget, appointment positions, or towards the overall freedom of those that live within the county borders? I will never get an answer to that question. The rest of the meeting made me feel like I was literally being robbed. All I ever heard were minutes regarding the budgetary allocations for fiscal year 2015 or, in a few cases, emergency appropriations for whatever said piece of legislature that was. They had their hands in my pockets by way of tax levies, regardless of how small they were. I don't care what it is, what it's for, or for how much. Taxation is theft. I was, again, thoroughly disgusted by the position I found myself in. In this instance, it was voluntary, but in the jury summons instance, it was not. In both cases, I found myself thoroughly disgusted with what I was witnessing. Only at least in this instance, on my birthday, I only came across the blatant robbery of my hard-earned dollars, and I wasn't forced to contribute to the tossing of a fellow citizen in a government dungeon for felony scratching. I will end with this. I despise being in a room full of Democrats that are either lusting for power or those that naively think that what they are doing is for the good of the people. I despise being in a room where I knew and felt like I didn't belong. It was probably the most traumatic feeling. In addition to that, and I don't know how anyone else could. Uh, in addition to that, I don't know how anyone could enjoy being in a room with people that are wasting their money and legislating nearly every aspect of their life, even at a county level. What I learned was that government at all levels is incompetent and does not care about your freedoms, no matter how much they tell you they do. It's important to not form any distinction between a lower form of authority or a higher form. It's all authority, and they all have some sort of control over your life. This will be concluded in part two, and that is the most important part of this article. If you want to see a legislature that truly puts the limited amount of freedoms you have left at risk in McLean County, stay tuned. You've just heard Adventures in Illinois Law, Part 1, Draconian Legislature at the County Level. Read by the author Shane Radliff, originally published on May 21st, 2015 at libertyunderattack.com, and part two will be released this week. <laughs>